Back here on the main stage in Ballpark Village, everybody very excited for our Baseball Operations Roundtable. Four executives here with the St. Louis Cardinals will set the deck. Mike Gersh, our VP and General Manager of the Ball Club. Randy Flores, Assistant GM and Director of Scouting. We've got uh, Moises Rodriguez, he's our Assistant General Manager, and Gary LaRock, Assistant GM and Director of Player Development. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here and for doing this. Most of this time will consist of your questions. We'll send around a microphone in just a minute, so be thinking up those. But uh, just briefly, let's start with this from all four of you. Uh, fans see you, you're public facing, but give us in a nutshell what it is that your role entails on a day-to-day. -day. We'll start with you, Gersh. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. It's a miserable morning to be out. Uh, luckily, spring training starts soon. So day-to-day, um, -day, my main responsibility the area that I oversee that no one else really does is baseball development, our analytics group. That's the part of the business I came up in um, and ran for a while, and that's the area that, that like, kind of reports through me. Um, more generally, it's supporting these guys and whatever they have going on and supporting the major league team and whatever their needs are. So as we go down this list, you'll notice that the, the major league team is not really you know, part of player development or scouting or what have you, and so that's the area that I spend a lot of time on. Flo, what about you, director of scouting? Everybody sees you, especially around draft time. But uh, give us an idea of what that looks like, 365, to be the director of scouting for a big league club. Well, I appreciate that. I, uh, I would say that the year kind of gets broken into thirds, and, and two-thirds of, of my year is, uh, is spent revolving around the amateur draft. And, and that's a mixture of scouting in the summer, the various showcases in Cape Cod and summer leagues, and then heading out across the country in the spring uh, scouting college and amateur high school players uh, in prep of the draft. The other third is here in St. Louis in a combination of visiting our affiliates, uh, working on our, our administrative and, uh, and transactions, um, and, then, and then kind of a, a little bit of spring training as well. And so most of that, about half is on the road, half in the office, but the focus is, is primarily around the amateur draft. Excellent. Moises, you are Assistant General Manager. Again, just tell us, day-to-day, -day, 365, what does your, your role look like? Well, sort of two main responsibilities. The main one, well, one of the main ones is helping Moen Gersh with the overall operation of the department, whether that's player acquisition by speaking to my counterparts at other clubs, trades, contract negotiations, helping out with arbitration and a host of other behind the scenes administrative duties that, that we all need to do on a daily basis. Second main responsibility is I oversee our international scouting department. Have been doing that uh, for a long time. Our international operations more broadly, which includes our academy down in Dominican Republic. And those are basically the two main things I handle. We have a robust setup. It is global in today's game and also a couple different places domestically. Gary, you're based out of Florida. We do a lot of minor league development at our Jupiter Complex. What does your role look like as a director of player development? Well, first, thank you for everybody uh, being here. Obviously, we appreciate all your support, as we always do. This is, I've been in three organizations in a variety of roles. This role's carried the greatest privilege of all, being the director of player development. The Cardinals, with our history and you as our fan base, and all the support we get is what really drives us day to day. Uh, we recognize that we have a responsibility and uh, we treat it very seriously as far as how we go about our day to day. My job working out of Florida and out of the spring training complex involves kind of two major portions during the year. Clearly it's 150 players plus and then it's 60 staff members, and it's the ability for us to make sure that we coordinate all our work in the off season to prepare. Right now is a, a very busy time. There is no time off. Very few weekends do you ever get really a chance to kind of back off a little because there's always something going on. Once the spring training starts and then we're in season, then you can well imagine all the, uh, all the work that goes with our staff, with. Uh, baseball development and our performance staff coordinating all of that together so that we're all working together. So it's a, a wonderful system to work within the, with the people we have. It's been a real privilege and we're very fortunate to have all of us working together on it. 
Again, we'll devote most of this time to your questions here if you're in the uh, floor here at Ballpark Village. So be thinking of them. We'll start passing that mic around in just a moment. I want to talk about kind of the transition. A player gets drafted, comes in, flow. Obviously, your group is overseeing that. And then you're doing player development. At what point does that handoff kind of happen? And what does the relationship look like between your two groups, your two staffs with a player as he develops? A moment to start, Gary, with that one? Sure, sure, sure. First of all, while you guys are listening to me, does the camera get in on this? I lost my ID like five minutes ago. So if anyone sees this ID that says Randy Flores, please turn it into someone so I can get into the office tomorrow. All right? That's, I got to take care of that. It's 10 minutes ago. Thank you. It's not a joke. The handoff. Our scouts spend a lot of time tr trying to get to know the players better, who they are. And so it's not only evaluating them as, as, a, as, as a talent, as a baseball player, but trying to get some sense of their receptivity to coaching, uh, their work ethic, um, what makes them tick, um, wh where are they and, and how much do they value education? Are we going to have to balance you know, them finishing their degree? And so our scouts then come into St. Louis and we have pre-draft meetings and we talk about their makeup uh, while, while Gary's there also. After drafting them, the ones we do select, we write up a little bit of a summary to try to hand off as much info as we can. The truth of the matter is, Gary and his staff, within a day or two, will know more than we ever will know about the players because now they're embedded with each other. And so we're trying to get better at that. We have imperfect information. And then Gary and his staff, within, within just a few days of immersion, really have a better sense of them. It's interesting because what Randy does sets the foundation for what we do when they arrive in Jupiter. Once a player walks into Jupiter, it's very important that we know them as well as possible. We want them to be in a comfort, a comfort zone, and it's very important that the kids feel as though they're in an organization that cares and they have us behind their backs immediately. And so we take a lot of time to understand who the players are, and that means a lot of work with the scouts, making sure we have all the information. Having scouted and having, uh, over the years in my experience, drafted players to come into a system, it is very important in that first month, in this case July now, because that's when players are drafted, it's very important that they get very comfortable quickly because we want to get the most out of them clearly. And it's a real challenge. I mean, that's always been a component of this game and a very important part of the game. Um, we're actually very proud to do it. We have a wonderful staff that works extremely hard to get to know the players, and uh, we feel as though we're a family real quick. Baseball today, uh, numbers are important, but you guys just spoke about it too. It's also very much a human business. For you, Gersh, give us a, a very high level just idea of how do you balance those two things? Mo was here yesterday and he talked about the new pitchers and how much they wanted to be in St. Louis, that that mattered. It was part of the, the calculus in acquiring them, but also it, it is a results business. So how do you balance numbers and also, I guess, eye test would be the cliche? Yeah, I think we spent um, a lot of time and energy as an organization trying to understand how to best predict future performance. That's what we're in the business of, predicting future performance of baseball players. Um, and you can do that analytically pretty well, but oftentimes, and not in all cases, but oftentimes you get to a point where people are more or less tied, right? Like our accuracy is not so great that we can say, you know, player X is clearly better than player Y. A lot of times it's these guys are very similar. And at that point, you still have to make a decision. and all the other factors become a huge part of, of figuring out how you want to break those ties. So uh, past performance, uh, you know, relationships with people, reputations in the game, what we can hear from teammates, from former coaches, uh, you know, what you just observe about how a guy goes about his business, what, what trajectory they're on, you know, where they are in their career, all those things factor in. And um, I think as an organization, we try to be data driven in our decision making, but not purely numbers driven, right? It's information driven in our decision making. And that information can take a lot of different forms. And, and I think this off season with our starting pitchers especially, it, there was a lot of it was people who wanted to be here, people who were, who were excited to be part of the Cardinals and help us get back to where we belong. One last one for you, Moises, and then we'll open it up for questions from the fans. Uh, the Dominican Academy, I think most of us here probably uh, the least familiar with that of any of the minor league affiliates. Tell us how that is different and maybe similar to what we would see from A-ball up through AAA here in the States. 
So it's an inter interesting setup. I would say 95% of the international players that we're acquiring go directly to our Santo Domingo complex. So we're talking about that's their first stop in our system. So it's a very different system than what we'd have in the U.S. because you're acquiring these players at 16, 17 years old. They're, they're basically being exposed to organized ball really for the first time, even though they play in academies and in showcases. Um, the, the important part about the academy is that they get acclimation, instruction, in addition to baseball instruction. So they get English classes. They get a heads up on what to expect when they arrive in the United States. On top of very detail-oriented uh, on-field instruction, as well as, excuse me, as well as the um, what, what they should expect before they travel. So nutrition is a big part of it. They actually live there. We're feeding them three times a day, sometimes four times a day, because they come in, they come in so physically weak and underdeveloped. So in that sense, it's just a very different structure because we're doing it at such a young age before they travel. All right, time to let you all start asking the questions. Team Fredbird will circulate with the microphone. Moises, I'm going to let uh, Team Fredbird grab the mic from you here. Just put a hand up. We would act, like to ask that you stand if you're here in the gallery, so that way uh, we can see you and maybe hear you a little bit better. And Team Fredbird will hold on to the mic while you ask your question of these four gentlemen. Hello, guys. Uh, yeah, I got one quick question. How are the uh, prospects in each organization ranked? Like, you know, your top prospects? How do you know who, it, uh, like, the top ten prospects are in, in, in your organization? How do you, how are they ranked? Like, like, you know, like, are they based on skills or based on potential or, or what? Well, I'll start and I'll pass this down to Gary. You know, our process for ranking our prospects, again, like I spoke about earlier, we try to be information driven, right? Um, we have all sorts of analytical tools to look at past performance, to look at the skills that they have. Um, as you probably know, the, the ability to track the, the ball off the bat, the, 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 the way the ball spins through the air, the pitcher throws, spin rates, movement, uh, vertical break, all those sorts of things, we have all that can be incorporated into it. Um, but because there are players, we have additional information about what makes them tick, how hard they work, how they look at the game, how they take instruction, all sorts of sort of proprietary information that, that would be very hard to find. As, as, as Flo said, you can, as a scout, you can observe, but you, you'll never the same thing as having somebody with you 24 hours a day for six months, right? And so we, that information is a huge part of our process. So I'll pass it down to Gary, you can talk a little bit about that. If I could just real quick add, one of the things that we talk about or you hear about prospect rankings, it sounds like your question was, how, how do we do it? And how do we do it might be separate than how MLB.com ranks our prospects or Baseball America ranks our prospects or third-party publications say the Cardinals farm system is ranked thus. For example, Tommy Edmond was never on an MLB.com or a fan graphs or Baseball America top 10 prospect list, but internally, we thought top, very high of uh, Tommy Edmond. Lars Newbar was never a prospect on a top 100 list getting national publication. Brendan Donovan was never on one of those lists. And so internally, Gary and his staff and their production put them on our radar in, in a way where we thought that they could break out, but it's independent from the mainstream third-party publication rankings. Not to mention that when we get internal into the player development system, we have 30 coaches, uniform coaches, who all have opinions. And we welcome rethinking constantly who those top 10 are. Example, when Brendan Donovan came through the system, and for all of you who, you're very knowledgeable, the Cardinal fans are tremendous. When he was in Peoria, was he in the top 10 anywhere? He ended up doing what he's continues to do, and I saw him the other day down in Jupiter, and he's working extremely hard again. So this is what happens within a system, within a development system, is we keep rethinking where those lists are and how we go about making sure players get the right um, opportunity within the confines of the season to make sure that they can develop, because there are surprises, as we all know. Lars Newbar is a wonderful example. 
And both of those players, ironically, are players who overachieved and have had better major league stretches than they did when they were in the minor leagues. And if you look back, you might say, why? It's because sometimes it's the thing we don't always within the industry measure at its peak, and that is their attitude of how they go about doing it. We're very fortunate we have some players like that. So the lists are wonderful. We're driven by it. We work with it every day, but we don't give into it and we keep rethinking. We have 150 players. I have to look at all 150 and make sure they understand they have to reach their ceiling. Stand, you know, they can stand, but they've got to reach. And the kids have been very good about that because of the players he's drafted. Good morning, gentlemen. I had a question about um, the analytical side from this last season. With the ban of the shift, um, were you guys um, hamstrung with the type of pitcher that you previously had that uh, were ground ball pitchers? And then with the ban of the shift, were you sort of uh, dug in a hole that we have what we have and we have to uh, deal with that? And until we can get possibly uh, new pitchers come in that are strikeout pitchers versus just ground ball pitchers. So the question there was about uh, swing and miss at, at pitchers in the game today versus ground ball pitchers. Has the shift impacted what we do and how we view that? I apologize. I, all I hear is an echo up here. I, I, I did my best. <laughs> um, I think the the shift certainly changed how um, it really it really only affects left-handed a certain type of left-handed hitter, right? It, it we weren't sh teams weren't shifting very much against right-handed batters, and if they are, you can still put your second baseman pretty much right behind second base, and it doesn't really change too much. Um, it certainly affects you know we had to rethink how we did all of our defensive positioning and the like, which is obvious. Um, it affects our pitching to some degree. Um, honestly, you know. I think there's a, 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 a like we have a reputation of like not wanting strikeouts and being focused. On, like we would love guys to strike everybody out. Like there's no, no misconception. We'd prefer the ball not to be in play ever, right? The trade-off between strikeouts and walks, and between ground balls and fly balls, and, and the trade-off across all of them is something that you know we're always trying to find the optimal mix. And um, I think the group that we got, we, we 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 were targeting more strikeouts, but we still we want we don't want walks. We don't want to, to put people on base without having done anything to sort of earn it, right? And while last year our defense was not what we had hoped, we still believe we have a strong defensive team going forward and that uh, we play in a pitcher's park. And so batted balls in a pitcher's park with a strong defense are a little bit less worrisome than they might be in Colorado or somewhere else. And um, it does affect, you know, we're always trying to evolve and, and, and get better and, and we would love to have the highest strikeout team in baseball if we can make that happen. Um, but that's what a lot of people are chasing, and it's hard to find those sorts of pitchers out there. So um, we're always kind of adjusting our process and trying to get better at it. But I, I don't think we haven't made, you know, the shift and, and the like haven't made dramatic changes in how we look at things. If I could add to what Mike said, which internally for us in the system, the good news is in the minor league system last year, organizationally, we were in the top five in uh, based on ball percentages for our pitchers to the good. That's a good thing. We're constantly in search of, and we do this, this is the way systems work. You're gonna have years where you're strong in an area and then other years where you're not quite as strong. That's my positive side, saying not quite as strong. And the reality is that's just how it works within all of player development. I could take us back 10 years ago where we said, we knew exactly what we had with all the pitchers coming up. And then we hit waves where, in fairness, we would draft or acquire a different type of player, which would be, it could go from pitching to regulars. We needed bats. Then it shifts again. It constantly shifts. Right now, we're working very hard. They've all done a tremendous job at working at us, being able to add those swing and miss pitchers. We're working very hard at that. Those things tend to go in waves, and we've got to, our responsibility in the system is to constantly provide the major league team with what they need to accomplish what has to be done. 
there are times when every system in all of baseball has other weaknesses. It's just a, it's a fact. In, in, in the privilege of all my years, I've been able to see that, and that's the challenge. That's why we keep rethinking it all the time. How do you figure out the lineups? The way, the way the lineup is set is uh, Oliver Marmel writes the lineup on the lineup card. Um, we, the front office provides some information. We, we, uh, we have projections, projected uh, performance for hitters versus pitcher, matchup-based projections and things like that that we provide down to the clubhouse. But at the end of the day, Ali and his staff determine on a day-to-day -day basis who's in the lineup and then what the batting order is based on a lot of stuff that you know, you can't plan for, right? Who's healthy, who's had a tough day, who got nicked up last night, who, you know, whatever, has something going on off the field that has them distracted or not getting good sleep. A, a million factors that, that we wouldn't necessarily always have our fingers on, and so uh, the lineup is, uh, is done by the Major League staff. What's your name, buddy? Cole, good question. Uh, uh, just Gary told me to kind of weigh in here. As a former player in the bullpen, a big part of what the manager does actually is, is think of a bullpen usage. And to, to Gersh's point about it, you can't always plan for it, the game dictates oftentimes who needs to be available and play. And you have to balance that with who's, who's actually fresh enough to pitch, right? And so a, a big part of that lineup is not even set on a lineup card. It's navigating the choices of that bullpen. And that's where, where Ollie and his staff, with the information provided, um, try to make the best decisions every inning of every game. Time for two more here with our baseball operations panel. If you have a question, throw that hand up. We've got one right over here on the aisle and one over there. Oh. Um, I know it's your guys' job to know your team and, and everything uh, in the minors, but how much time is spent on knowing the other teams and their players and their minor leagues uh, players as far as for trades and looking for free agency. I know uh, every time a trade is made, I think uh, when, when a minor leaguer is trade, everybody's hoping like, oh gosh, I hope he doesn't become a, another Randy Rosarena for somebody else. So how, how much time is likely spent on making sure you know the other players? So the question is how much time do we dedicate to scouting other organizations? So we've got what's called the pro scouting department. And this scouting department is not like Randy. Randy's focus on the draft. The pro scouting department, they dedicate all their efforts to making sure they know all players on all other teams. As you can imagine, there, there's tons of players, but we also have an army of scouts that are spread out throughout the United States. Uh, there's a regional uh, strategy when we dispatch scouts to uh, cover all the different levels of the opposing minor leagues. So when you say how much time during the season, that's from opening day all the way to the end of the playoffs of whatever level is still uh, playing. So I, I would say it's sort of every day there's scouting reports and we combine those scouting reports with some of the performance uh, projections that Gersh spoke about earlier, but it, it's, it's nonstop behind the scenes, filing reports, Lots of flights for our pro scouts, and not just once. I mean, you may see a guy one day and may not look great, and you'll go back next month, and he's a different person. So um, not sure if that answers your question, but yeah, we're, we're out there daily. If, if I'll jump in here, just because you asked about the trade deadline, one of the things that was, was uh, an example is the teamwork that went involved to try to get the evaluations of another player. What I mean by that is Gersh talks about projections, right? predicting from past performance what someone will do in the future. Then you have our boots on ground scouts watching. But know who else is watching is our own staff's coaches. And so there was a trade scenario that did not work out this year for us, meaning we did not make the trade. But the players that were tagged analytically, that were liked and evaluated strongly by our scouts, we also canvassed Gary's staff there in the Florida Complex League on who they liked it. And those three all had agreement on a couple of players, and those players were involved in transactions. And it was really a pretty cool example of the teamwork that goes to try to get that 360 view of another team's players, to your question. Our final question here, I think there was one on the aisle, maybe. 
right there. Yeah, so this offseason, we've seen a lot of teams like the Dodgers go after Japanese talent very aggressively. Um, but in that league, uh, they play the game a lot differently, but they're also really talented, like we saw in the World Baseball Classic. So how does the Cardinals organization value talent from overseas um, from those foreign leagues like that? So the question was, how does the Cardinals organization value talent and evaluate talent overseas? Specifically, he was asking about uh, the Japanese market and our operations there. Yeah, so the, um, the Japanese and Korean markets become a bigger part of free agency seemingly every year for the last few years. Um, we have a, um, a, a, a front office, Matt Slater, based in St. Louis, who has a long history of working with, the, uh, with, with and around MPB baseball in Japan. And he has uh, a, a guy, an assist, a scout based out of Japan who helps us with on the boots on the ground, like let, Part of, the, part of the challenge, honestly, is knowing who might be coming over each year. There's hundreds of professional baseball players in Asia, and you can't scout all of them, and only a handful will be posted in any given year. So getting, getting inside information on which ones to be ready for, which ones to focus on, is sort of step one of evaluation. Um, and then we have some of the pro scouts that Moy was talking to will fly over to Asia, you know, one or two each season to spend a week or ten days, and they will know here are the five or six guys that we think are most likely to be available this offseason so we can target them. And we do have a process by which we can say your performance in Korea or in Japan would translate to about this in the big leagues, right? Like that, that's part of what we're trying to do analytically. We have uh, video on all these guys. So there's actually a lot of information on them without actually any, having to you know, travel across the Pacific to go see them in person. And, and that's why we've been in a position where we feel comfortable making making uh, investments in guys like Mike Liss and KK and uh, you know Verhagen and others. You know some work better than others, but it's uh, an area that we feel pretty comfortable about a, a good a good handle on where we think pl players will be and who can help us. Mike Gersh, Randy Flores, Moises Rodriguez, and Gary Larock. Thank you for your questions, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. More to come from Winter Warm Up 2024 here on the main stage.